Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Joy, Kira. Now, they focus on hybridity. And when I first talked, uh, when he first talked about hybridity, I said, well, I drive a hybrid car. <laughs> but he says, no, it's not about the car. It's about the challenge of really reaching out and understanding and reaching out the uh, people who have come from mixed cultures and how do we effectively reach the hybrid. And so I thank God for this opportunity that he has given me to give some opening remarks and opening uh, message in relation to this. Now, this is really preaching to the choir. In fact, uh, you have more prepared. And uh, that, that, the good about the keynote is you just turn on the key and then you discuss. Okay? Uh, but let me just share with you uh, some thoughts that I have in relation to this topic on hybridity and uh, just to continue to and give you some challenge for your discussion in the next few days. So first of which, I want to say that it is God who determined the geopolitical boundaries. Um, it was God who made me to become a Filipino. Uh, it was God who uh, made many of you coming from different countries. How many countries? 13 countries represented here? 19 countries represented here. It was God who determined uh, in uh, Acts chapter 17, verse 26, he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth, having determined allotted periods and the boundaries of their dwelling place. So from one man and one woman, Adam and Eve, uh, there is that multiplication of all of these people all over the world. But it was God who determined when will, when will be our generation. And it was God who determined what will be our nationality and uh, our geopolitical boundaries. In fact, in uh, Deuteronomy chapter 32, uh, when we are called to worship the Lord, and uh, they are reminded that when the Most High gave to the nations their inheritance, when He divided mankind, He fixed the borders of the peoples according to the numbers of the sons, you know, ESB would say sons of God, but the Masoretic text according to Dr. Shaw is sons of Israel. Uh, but uh, what we see here, it is the Lord God who determined our boundaries. And uh, I want us to see that, you know, I appreciate me being a Filipino. And I do not complain that I am a Filipino. I, I, I rejoice that I am a Filipino. In, a, in, a, in the same way that all of you rejoice at your respective nationalities. Because that is part of the design that God has given us. That we are, that we belong to a certain um, geopolitical uh, engagement and identity. However, migration has changed the landscape of human habitation. And uh, you have how many sessions? Uh, 12 sessions to be discussing all of these issues and, to, and uh, three devotions about hybridity in the Bible. Um, migration. And let me just uh, share with you, and uh, I think we all know that uh, there are different uh, causes of migration. So um, without belaboring, I would say that these are some of them. Uh, environmental, because of uh, either natural calamities, natural disasters, or the search for better climate. Uh, some people have to migrate. In fact, some people, uh, would have their homes in the northern hemisphere, but will fly south uh, during winter because uh, of climate issue. But uh, some, some of us are more accustomed to a temperate climate like the Philippines, and we enjoy living in the Philippines. And um, some of you would uh, feel enjoying shoveling snow. I did that for at least two winters, but I, I said that's enough. <laughs> uh, it's good to enjoy only for visiting. Uh, but so environmental uh, factor, particularly calamities and natural disasters, would be a major cause for migration. 
And another major cause is economic cause or factor for migration. So um, many Filipinos are now moving into Canada, but not only Filipinos. I think uh, Canada is the most, uh, you know, has made that uh, policy of migration being competitive, trying to make sure that in order to arrest the negative birth rate that they have, because if they did not open to migration, they will be extinct. Uh, because they are having negative uh, gr uh, growth rate. And so they open migration uh, to, to professionals because they want to make sure that there are enough people who will support the social security of those who are retiring. Is right? That's part of demography, but economic fa fa uh, considerations. But it's actually, and some of these people are uh, voluntarily migrating but there are also others down history who were forcibly migrated for economic reasons. And I hope you, um, when you begin to discuss, particularly people who were descendants of those who were taken as slaves from Africa to be brought to the Northern Hemisphere. I think that's an issue to understand when it comes to hybridity and understand how these people are reacting. I cannot identify with them because I've not had that experience. But I think it's important that as a church, we need to understand that dynamics of those people who come out from forcibly, you know, being forced out of the situation for economic considerations. The slave trade uh, should be considered as factor to discuss in terms of what happened to the dynamics of the people, to the, the psyche of the people who came from that background. Cultural migration, particularly when it comes to religious freedom as well as education. Um, we know that people come, you know, had to, uh, America was built by people who were coming out of persecution and would like to really have their own religious expression. But now we have many students who go to different countries. And what's the, pop, what's the percentage of students who come back after they study in America? Later. Okay, so you can share those statistics. But my question is, how many foreign students return to their country of origin after they study? The majority, either immediately after graduation, or maybe a few years in their host country, but then many of them do finally go back home later. Mm -hmm. So what was formerly a brain drain has become a brain gain, eventually. Okay, so the, the statistics is now being reversed because it used to be that there was about 90% who stay in the country where they are the, having their studies. But I, I'm glad to see that the, the statistics is, go, you know, is, is being reversed, that there are more who are coming back to their country of origin, okay? I'm one of those few who return to the Philippines immediately. Uh, uh, cultural, and then political. So, can you imagine the people who currently ha are on the refugees around the world? There are about 65 million refugees around the world today. It's not only the several million coming out of uh, Syria and the conflict there, but all over the world, there's about 65 million refugees brought about by civil war or escaping from political persecution that brought about migration and then the social consideration, uh, moving for better quality of life or moving closer to a family member or friend. I think uh, um, that's one of the factor, uh, marker for migration to the, for Canada. If you, have a, if you are a professional, if, you are, if your profession is on demand, and if you have good family connections in Canada, and then you come up to the uh, great level because they used to say, there's a great opportunity of you having that family support while you are there. 
So my, as I've said, migration has changed the landscape of human habitation. Now, the results of this migration actually gave rise to hybridity. And one of some of the results of migration. The first result would be, well, there's the changes of population distribution. So the migration contributed to the development of separate cultures as well as diffusion of cultures and uh, the mix, uh, cultural mix, or there is that multicultural populations. Um, I think in America, um, when I was interacting with Ray Bakke back in the 80s, he was one of those who began to discuss about this migration and this uh, cities movement. And he talks about in his area during that time in Chicago, uh, how many square kilometers, there are 52 different ethnic groups or cultures right within uh, his own neighborhood. And I think all over the world you would see that kind of multiplicity and the uh, cultural mix that we see uh, in terms of the uh, population. So it's not anymore just uh, um, when you talk of America, the Native Americans are the Indians and uh, all of them are actually migrants. So even President Trump is a migrant. Anyway, I'm, uh, <laughs> yeah, do you be, you know, he's a migrant also. Okay, I will not go de deeper. <laughs> then there is the mixing of different cultures and races. And this mixing often led to negative social behaviors as well as tensions between the majority population and the minority population in that country. So you, when you have like a apartheid in South Africa, or we will have the racial divide in different countries up to now. Uh, so the tension is even there. So um, all of this uh, divide between the majority and the minority population in the country would um, have those uh, local struggles, racial discrimination, and so those racial tensions as uh, what we see. And then there is the mixing of different cultures of races. There is also, I would say, the, while there is the negative, but there's also the positive aspects of cultural migration because you are enriching the culture as well as uh, the community in terms of the experience and new knowledge that are being contributed for the migrants that are coming in that particular area. And then uh, we have also the demographic consequences of migration because in many cases, uh, migration is selected in terms of age group because it's my, uh, mostly the migrants who are mostly young and productive who are migrating. Uh, today, there's about more than 10 million Filipinos who are working in different countries around the world. And uh, if you look at the different um, uh, society, we have those kind of uh, younger generation. And I, I'm going back to Canada because they have always asked me if you, wa if you want to apply for Canada uh, migration. I said, uh, uh, no, I'm staying here in the Philippines. But I can visit Canada when I want to. Okay. So, uh, so there's population aging in some countries as the younger generation have to go and look for better opportunities in different countries. So, the, and then the last is the economic results. I think uh, both from the country that, uh, you know, for the Philippines, we are encouraging these of, uh, overseas Filipino workers because they are the one of the, you know, uh, in terms of the uh, gross domestic product of the country is the remittances about uh, more than $20 billion are being remit remitted by the overseas Filipino workers. So there's economic results, although I would say also that there is social economic uh, negative impact also of separation of homes and dysfunctional families. But uh, those that are, have migrated in other countries, they also have contributed to the economic development. So all of these results of migration actually would say gave rise to the hybrids because the migrants need to cope in their new environment. The hybrids need to know how 
to be able to handle the situation. Uh, because to become, um, uh, you need to be able to, you know, in some of those countries, being bilingual has greater advantage rather than just uh, being monocultural or being only, have, speaking only one language. And therefore, uh, the rise of the hybrids is brought about being forced by the need for coping in the different mix of culture. I did not attempt to make a definition of hybridity. Uh, that's, a, that's a discussion that you have. And uh, you have already uh, definitions from different uh, papers that have been presented, the, the, doctor, the dissertation of Juliet. So you have already the definition. So what I use here is just the common definition. First, from biology. Uh, so animals or plants, different breeds, varieties. Uh, this is actually a dictionary definition. So uh, by genetic um, engineering or uh, intervention, there is that hybrid. And normally, the hybrid are better crop or better animal. But the problem with that is they cannot continue to reproduce because they have to be dependent on that kind of uh, um, products, production of hybrid seed or hybrid animal. Then in terms of culture, there's the person or group of persons produced by the interaction of crossbreeding of two unlike cultures, traditions, and others. Technically, on, te on technical definition, something that is powered by more than one source of power, like I'm driving a hybrid car, okay? Uh, so to have cheaper, uh, uh, cheaper gasoline, but actually what you save in terms of cheaper gasoline, you pay for the higher price of that car, okay? But I did not buy that car, it was given to me, and I enjoy it. Okay, so having said that, I'd like to focus on the purpose of this consultation. The purpose of this consultation, why are you here? You are here to discuss, discover the implications of hybridity in the mission of God. That's why you have those 12 sessions. And Dr. Joy said that, yes, you are all participants, and we need to discuss, and we need to interact. We need to be able to say we contribute to the enrichment of the discussion as well as the input and understanding. And hopefully, you can define better strategy and uh, sharpen strategies in how to really reach uh, and minister to this group of people that we call hybrid. So let me focus on handling the issues, uh, of, uh, on some of the issues and concerns on hybridity. And I have at least five that I want to share tonight. Number one is that the hybrids have confused and conflicting identities. We need to be able to minister to them, care for them, because they are living in multiple cultures, they have uh, multiple uh, various backgrounds and values, and sometimes, am I a Filipino or am I an, uh, an Amer um, um, American? And uh, you have that discussion of being a coconut or being a banana. Um, but sometimes the problem of, the, of these migrants or this hybrid, because they are not, they, are, they say, no, I am, um, I am an American, I'm holder of an American passport, I go to American school, and, but when they go home, they are being asked to speak their native language or to have the, and to, have, to behave as if they are still living in India or they are still living in the Philippines or they are still living in Korea. So sometimes these conflicting identities and, um, and values it's a challenge for this hybrid. The second issue and concern on hybridity is their vulnerability to predators and negative influences. They go to school and they sometimes, they are said, you are Asian. You know, um, somebody just sent me that post on uh, the Filipino family who was buying um, 
grocery there, and this is just the other, just the other day, buying grocery, and somebody behind her was a Caucasian who says, oh, you buy all our, you take, buy all our foods. How many of you have seen that? Yeah, you buy all our food, you buy all our, if I was there, like I said, you also come from a different country, right? But, uh, but uh, it's good that that person did not uh, uh, take, uh, you know, you know, <laughs> uh, did not challenge that uh, person who was so racist. So, but sometimes the hybrid can fall prey to the drug people or to the violence because, first of all, they were having some confusion on their identity, on their values, and then they become vulnerable. And if we don't help them, if we don't reach out to them, then they will just look for people who will give attention and care for them. And it could be the negative influence. The third issue is that the hybrids have that sense of openness and responsiveness to right stimulus. To those who will care and understand them, they will open up. They are having a problem when the, in their home. They says, you behave like we used to behave as the parents having their own uh, sets of values and culture. When they are in school or when they are playing with their, with their peers or their people, then they, are, uh, having a di they have to live with different set of culture and values. And therefore, sometimes in the time of confusion and the time of uh, looking for their identity, those who understand them, those who care for them, are the ones who could minister to them. And they will be open and they will accept and they will say, you know, my parents do not understand me, but you understand me. And therefore, it's important for us to say there is that certain, you know, there is that window of openness and responsiveness if we give them that right stimulus. The fourth is that, you know, the fourth uh, issue and concern is that the hybrids possesses great potential to excel. Why? They can harness the strength of the best of both worlds. You know that sometimes the Asian students actually excel in the, in the United States. Is that true, um, Atelisa? Yeah. The Asian, the, the Asian students make good um, in the United States. And sometimes the businessmen actually are also making good uh, in, in, the, in the Western context. Why? Because uh, first, you know, in their coping mechanism in order to say, I still I belong, they try to excel and they try to accept their best effort, but yet they can also draw some of the best, you know, as I've said, they can harness the best of both worlds. The Western world and uh, the Oriental world, and we can, they can harness that and they can really excel, right? And therefore, if we minister to them, these are some of the best people who could actually be used by God in the ministry, in the whatever uh, area, or even in professional development. And finally, let me end by saying that this is the great challenge, and that is the neglect of the church in effectively addressing their situation. We have a conflict of an ethnic churches versus the multicultural generation. Some of the problems that I have seen are some of young people, uh, you know, I visit so many ethnic churches in the U.S. as well as in other countries. And when, you know, uh, when they have their own worship, uh, it's trying to say, to still preserve their ethnicity as a church. And it's important, especially for the adults, because that's, you know, that's their identity. Um, Whenever I go to a Filipino church in America, uh, it, they always end up having a lunch, potluck or something together. And uh, some people would go more for the potluck rather than the worship, right? Uh, and that's not only for, I think that's true for most Asians. 
But their children says, I don't belong here. The activities in the church are still so focused on that ethnicity that the children says, well, if I'm in school, I have a Western mindset, I have a Western values. When I'm in the church, they are trying to force me back again to that mindset. But during the week, uh, you know, I'm exposed to the different sets of values and, uh, cul and, uh, and standards and, and culture. Therefore, even as a church, we need to be able to say that we can address properly and effectively care for the hybrids in the churches, particularly the second and third generation. So let me end by saying that we can learn from two examples. Two biblical examples that I would use for end, to end, and that is first, Mother Mary, to ba the baby and adolescent Jesus. When you look chapter two, we see here how Mama Mary, Mother Mary, really took care of the hybrid. Who is that hybrid? Jesus. In the one person of Christ, there are two natures, the divine and the human. And you can really see there the dynamic of Jesus being a hybrid. So that when Jesus was born, he was born in the manger, and then the shepherds came. And Joseph maybe and the others could not understand, you know, he was born in the manger, but some of the people who visited are some of the wise men from the east, and now here, here's the shepherds who were glorifying and praising God. You know what Mary said? After hearing what the shepherds said about Christ and how people are recognizing Christ and how the angels declared that unto you this day is born in the city of David the Savior who is Christ the Lord. Mary treasured up all these things, pondering them in her heart. She was saying, how do I handle this? How do I handle this tension? How do I prepare this child? So that see, uh, that, that child will grow up to be a person who will be able to express true incarnation and fulfill the divine uh, role and, and ministry that he has. How do I understand that here it is that this person, this baby, is both God, 100%, and human, 100%. So Mary treasured up all these things in her heart. Now, came during the time of the adolescence of Jesus, later on, a few verses after that, that when, uh, you know, uh, when Jesus had his bar mitzvah at 12 years old, he brought them to the temple, and Jesus stayed at the temple. And for three days, they were looking for him. And when they saw the boy Jesus there at the temple, talking with the priests, talking with the leaders, what was Jesus, you know, Mary said, Son, why have you treated us so? We were practically looking for you. We were worried about you. What was the response of Jesus? Didn't you know that I have to be in my father's business? How do Mary respond to such a hybrid? So the response is that, and his man, you know, and Jesus went to them and was submissive to, uh, to, to them, going to back to Nazareth, and his mother treasured up all these things in her heart. There's so much reflection that she had to do on how to handle this hybrid, how to respond to him, how to help him so that he will not be somebody who will be an outcast in the community but somebody who has good relationship. That's why in verse 52, you notice the summary statement of 18 years of the life of Jesus. 18 years because he was 12 years old when, he was, when this happened, and the next verse after that is when he was already 30 years old. 
But that 18 years is encapsulated in that verse. And Jesus increased in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and man. And that was preceded by that thought that Mary treasured all these things in her heart. That for the next 18 years, Mary was able to nurture, care for, and love that baby. That adolescent, that young man. So that when he began his ministry at age 30, there was so much input from Mary to the growth and increase of the wisdom, stature, as well as social engagement and spiritual development of this man, infinite man, Jesus. There's so much reflection about how to deal with hybrid. The other one is my favorite apostle, the apostle Paul. You see how he adapted Timothy. When he recruited Timothy as a young man to join them in the ministry, now he had to circumcise him. Why? Because he is a hybrid. His father is a Greek. And his mother and grandmother are Jewish people. And that Paul had to make a decision. I had to circumcise him to please the Jewish people. But, but you see there the dynamics of how he had to handle this hybrid Timothy. But you know, how was Paul able to minister to Timothy? How was Paul able to really help him to become a, you know, a great minister and servant of the Lord? The last two letters of the Apostle Paul was devoted to his son. And so how did he call him? To Timothy, my true child in the faith. If we want to be able to be effective in ministering and caring for the hybrid, we need to look at them with that same care, love, and acceptance that we are willing to say, you become my son, you become my child. That's what Apostle Paul did to his son, uh, to Timothy in order that Timothy will become effective as a hybrid. He said in 2 Timothy 1, 2, to Timothy, my beloved child. And so as you discuss this issue about hybridity for the mission of God, then it's important for us to learn from these two examples that I had. From Mary, who took care of Jesus. And from Paul, who took care of Timothy. Now let me end by asking you those, you know, uh, giving you two questions that you can say, yeah, have in this consultation. First question is, how will the church effectively address the challenges and opportunities of hybridity for global mission? As you have all of these sessions, as you have all of this discussion, maybe the underlying question that you need to have is, what, is, you know, what, what does it mean for me as a missiologist? as a church leader, as a pastor, as a minister, how will the church effectively address these challenges and opportunities? So both the challenges and opportunities of hybridity. And then after uh, you discuss that, then you also ask the second question, what basic strategies do we need to develop to reach the hybrids for Jesus? May you have a good consultation. God bless you.